right. Okay. Welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Billy Weitzer. I'm the executive director of the Leo Beck Institute and thrilled to have this uh, event. Um, it looks like we've got already 135 people and that number may grow. Um, the event is coming out of uh, an exhibit that we put together on Washington Heights, which maybe some of you were fortunate enough to see it before we all began sheltering in place. If not, we uh, intend to have it uh, open when we're done sheltering in place. Uh, assuming that's at some point in the uh, later in the year, we hope that people could come and see it. But we've also made an electronic version of it. So you're welcome to go see it uh, at any time online. Uh, and uh, you can good, find it very easily through our website, uh, which is lbi.org. Um, and I do uh, want to thank a lot of people as I introduce people. Uh, our, our moderator, Rob Snyder, was, was uh, very much a part of making this exhibit. But um, also, I don't know if she's on the call, but uh, Magda Robel uh, was the project director and uh, helped put this uh, together. And we partnered with the Y, and uh, the Y served as a co-host for this event as well. Uh, I'm going to introduce the panelists who will speak. Um, after which time we will take questions. Um, we were having difficulty making the actual chat work. So uh, David Brown, who's our director of programs and communications will explain how you can raise your hand to tell us you have a question and you will be unmuted and ask that question. But David, I suggest you wait to give those instructions until we're actually waiting for uh, what we'll, we'll get to the Q and A. Okay. So um, I want to get to the, 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 the actual panel itself. So I, will the panelists please forgive me if I don't read their entire bios, but I do want to introduce them. As I mentioned before, Rob Snyder was very influential in uh, helping us put together this uh, exhibit, uh, much of it based on uh, his excellent book, Crossing Broadway, Washington Heights and the Promise of New York. Rob is a professional uh, professor of journalism and American studies at Rutgers University, Newark. He's also a Manhattan Borough historian. Uh, in addition to the book I mentioned, he co-authored All the Nations Under Heaven, Immigrants, Migrants, and Making of New York. Um, then we have uh, Lori Geminer Bieler, who is the granddaughter of German Jewish refugees who settled in Washington Heights. She's an associate professor of history at Framingham State University in Massachusetts, and the author of Cities of Refuge, German Jews in London and New York, 1935 to 45. She also uh, is a past recipient of the LBI Day, uh, Day Research Fellowship. Cynthia Carrion uh, spent her career focused on bringing her passion, dedication, and expertise to a variety of youth and community-based organizations throughout New York City and beyond. She's had many interesting roles and titles, Deputy Director of the Northern Manhattan Coalition for Immigrant Rights, National Youth Programs Coordinator at Amnesty International, and Director of Community uh, Development at the School in the Square in Washington Heights. Uh, and last but not least, uh, least uh, are from our partner organization of the YM and YWHA of Washington Heights and Inwood, Victoria Neznansky, who um, is an uh, immigrant from Ukraine in the former Soviet Union, earned her master's degree in social work at New York University, and has devoted her career to the field of trauma and immigration. Um, one notable uh, thing that, that we found very nice, the connection between uh, the German Jewish uh, part of Washington Heights and the uh, Dominican is that um, Victoria conceived and oversaw Sosua, Dare to Dance Together, which brought together Dominican and Jewish youth of Washington Heights and Inwood in a musical production. And there also is an award-winning documentary of that, which I encourage people to investigate. Um, I hope that doesn't take too much time, but it is a distinguished panel. We're very glad to have you here, and I'm going to turn it over to Rob, who will serve as our moderator. Thank you, Billy, and thank you, everyone, for coming out today for this discussion. When I was researching my book, Crossing Broadway, I came across a fascinating point. 
that Washington Heights and Inwood are the home of refugees from Hitler, Stalin, Trujillo, just for starters. And I've always been haunted by that fact and not sure what to make of that fact. And I'm very grateful that today we have three panelists together who can shed light on what this question means. And I wanna explore it with them today and then open up to talk with all of you. I'm gonna start with Lori, who has studied German Jewish refugees in both New York and London. And Lori, could you just begin by telling us how do memory and nostalgia both shape our understanding of the lives of German Jews in Upper Manhattan, particularly during the peak years of refugee arrivals in the 1930s and 1940s? Thank you, Robert. And it's so nice to see so many of you here. Um, so as Robert mentioned, my work focuses on uh, the first approximate 10 years of arrival of uh, German Jewish refugees in Washington Heights in New York as a whole. Um, and if we're talking about nostalgia and memory, um, I began my project thinking about my grandparents and my experience growing up, going into Washington Heights on the weekends. Um, <laughs> and my memories of that. But what my research, my historical research interest is in is in the day-to-day -day experience of refugees in Washington Heights before the end of World War II, before they knew what happened to their families. So the, the focus of my work is on the day-to-day -day life and really looking at the, um, the patterns of trauma and I, I said earlier to Robert about hope and resilience, how, how those two were interplaying with one another with a sort of overlying uncertainty uh, weighing on pretty much everyone's minds there. Um, but I know that there is a strong sense of nostalgia for this neighborhood and what it meant, especially after the war with families raising children there in the 50s and the 60s. And, um, so I was more fascinated for myself with the period before, just before and during World War II rather than um, after the war. So I, and that might be self-preservation because after the war, the residents of Washington Heights learned what happened to their families. And that was is obviously extremely painful to study. So I am more interested in the processes of um, refugees living in a new city and how they coped. And my work does a comparative study of London, German Jewish refugees in London and German Jewish refugees in New York. So it compares the different circumstances. And so that's where my interest lies. Cynthia, could you pick up on that a little bit? You're, in, you're here today in part because your mother sought refuge from the Trujillo regime by moving to New York City and Washington Heights. What has she passed down to you from that experience and how do these memories multiplied by many individuals shaped the Dominican community in Northern Manhattan. What? Mute. A mute. She might not be able to. The host has to do it. Hi ah. everyone, thank you about that. Um, we gotcha. We gotcha. <laughs> I'm here. Um, so, so thank you. This is this is really an honor to to be on this panel with everyone and and to share a little bit of my experience. Um, so the question is, um, you know, my grandmother was one of the first Dominicans in Washington Heights before I think New York City even knew what a Dominican was back in in the uh, late 50s and, and early 60s, um, and. You know, I think that as um, a second generation Dominican in, in Washington Heights, um, the legacy and trauma of that period stayed with our family for a very long time. And I think as a, a community, it also um, was felt in, in various ways. Um, so I think the original question around, you know, what that meant for, for my family um, and, Dominican Republic being so close to New York also allowed for us to experience this uh, kind of revolving door of um, connection to an island where people thought that they were leaving just for a time until things settled and then they would return. 
Um, and I think that that kind of allowed for many Dominicans to think that, you know, they're going to come home one day and this is just a temporary space for us. Um, and I think as the second generations, this has now become home for us. Um, and I think what gets shared with, um, you know, when I asked my mother, right, mom, I'm on this panel talking about, you know, like what it meant to be a Dominican in Washington Heights, you know, she takes a deep breath. And she says, you should read Dominicana, which is the book I gave her after I read it, right, uh, by Angie Cruz, um, which highlights what it was like for a young immigrant to come to Washington Heights um, in the 60s. Um, and for her, she felt like she was reading her life story unfold. Um, and it was actually one of the first times where I really got to hear what it meant for a young girl of 18, 19 years old during that time to be in New York City after going through the trauma of Trujillo. So she was, as, as a young person, an organizer against the regime, was trying to support the Juan Bosch um, government. And my grandmother got really nervous and told her she was going on a vacation to New York, but only gave her a one-way ticket. Um, and so all of a sudden, my mom thought she was here for the summer and found out that she was here for a very long time. Um, and I think that there was a lot of back and forth around what that meant for her personally. Um, but little by little, a lot of her friends also started coming to, to um, Washington Heights. Um, and, you know, there was a very different experience around, you know, being being young and having a lot more freedom than you had during the Dominican Republic, during the curfews. Um, she also experienced her school being bombed during the American um, intervention. And so I think, you know, there was a trauma around Trujillo, but there was also a trauma around, you know, this, this American intervention. Um, and so I think all of that to then say, now, now you're here in America, um, and my grandfather actually decided never to come to the United States um, because he felt like that was also part of this, this invasion, this, this um, uh, imperialistic connection. Um, and so to now have all of his grandchildren be Americans um, is, is a really interesting turn of events. Um, but I think for us, Washington Heights became both a refuge and, and a challenge around establishing a new way of life. Thank you very, very much. Victoria, under the best of circumstances, the experience of immigration challenges immigrants. How did memories of life in the Soviet Union trouble and strengthen Soviet Jews who immigrated to Northern Manhattan? Um, thank you for the question. And hello, everybody. I think I saw very briefly some very familiar faces. So I'm very thrilled to see some of you who I know and meet somebody who we don't. So I'm, I'm in a unique position to uh, bring my point of view to the discussion because I, um, I also work at the Y. So my professional affiliation with an agency um, kind of um, informed my view on the community of Washington Heights. I've been working with the Y for uh, 10 years and a little bit more. And I've gotten to know the community really, really very strongly and very intimately. And uh, my background as a Soviet Jew and immigrant from 1989 with a major wave of Jewish refugees came to the United States. Um, and uh, the quite, quite traumatic experience of living under the totalitarian regime that as a young person was not really experienced as a, a tremendous totalitarian regime as you grow in a way adapting to any environment, especially when you're young. And then later when I started to um, kind of wake up and in my young adolescent years, trying to see the, the wave of everything what was happening and maturing and going through, through the awareness uh, both personally and collectively, I couldn't stop thinking about the collective trauma. And I know that Lori has mentioned a little bit about that. What is the collective trauma? So I, I do want to mention that that all of the Soviet, um, whether they're Jews or not Jews, all of the Soviet citizens living under the totalitarian regime for so many years um, have experienced this collective trauma. And whether the younger generations or not, 
Washington Heights community actually has a tremendous amount of older immigrants. So the older Jewish immigrants, all of them are Holocaust survivors by definition, because it's not only the German Holocaust survivors who actually um, you know, survived, but the Russian Jews who were attacked on their territories and were subject to full extermination, um, including millions and millions of Jews. Uh, that partially was connected to the whole um, notion that every single Soviet refugee is now a Holocaust survivor. So when we look at the community of Washington Heights, it comprised of uh, a lot of elder uh, immigrants who are settling here and not going anywhere. And then at the time of 78 and 89, there were young families who came to Washington Heights with full hopes and aspirations and unlike Cynthia's experiences with her family that is leaving the island, the Soviet Jews kissed the ground. They knew they will never see their homeland again. And they came here to make it home. And uh, Washington Heights became the community for them as one of those Brooklyn communities in Queens and the Bronx where they were settled. But Washington Heights rent was cheap. So they came without knowing what the culture of the community, what does it mean to be in a diverse environment? They came to live and survive and make it their home. So, but they all carried their collective trauma with them. And the way they adapted and the way they sought each other was really to connect through their traumatic experiences, which doesn't mean necessarily all negative. It's just still a collective trauma. And the resilience that maybe we can touch upon at the end, connecting to how we can all learn from each other to be more resilient in this very, very difficult pandemic. We can go back to all our immigrant roots because the collective trauma and any trauma can also lead to post-traumatic growth and resilience. So we can talk more about it. Look, let's pick up on that theme of resilience a little bit. I'll start with Lori and then work back through the three of you. Were there things that German Jewish refugees learned, acquired, did in Germany that helped them survive in some way when they came to New York City in the 30s and early 1940s? Yes, one of the, I think, lifesavers for uh, the German Jews who came to uh, the U.S. and London and really all over the world was that they had a tradition of uh, being highly organized. So they, they had organizations for everything. They had organizations, an umbrella organization for all Germans of Jewish descent. They had clubs for every hobby you could imagine. They had self-help to help impoverished people. So there was this tradition that was at least 50 years old, a couple generations um, in Germany prior to emigration that they brought with them. And so you start to see in, in the very early years um, of arrival. So even by most, the pickup really began in like 36, 37 of refugees of German Jews coming to Washington Heights. You see the explosion of these organizations, just a proliferation of all different kinds. I mean, every single kind of hobby interest you can imagine, um, and also work related professional organizations. And so that helped, I believe, uh, played a significant role for Jewish refugees across the world. Um, it helped them create networks, both, you know, professional networks, but social networks, emotional networks. Um, and that, that whole, um, so you could do a vast map of the organizational life of German Jews. I'm sure there's another book to be written there about that. Um, that even just in those 10 years was really amazing and, and helped support the refugees who first, who came um, later. Cynthia, I couldn't miss seeing you smile when Lori started to talk about the German Jews and their many organizations, because I've heard Dominicans praised many times for having a genius for organizations, from sporting clubs to hometown associations to political parties. So can you pick up on that theme of resilience and the things that Dominicans learned and did in the Dominican Republic that helped them once they came to the USA and Washington Heights? Yeah, and, and you know, um... I, I was actually laughing also because I think sometimes Dominicans also get the, the reverse uh, <laughs> uh, stereotype around uh, the order is not maybe um, what you sometimes think about when you see us at a bus stop uh, <laughs> waiting to get on. Um, but there is a lot of um, 
I think the the social um, uh, opportunities for connection was very strong, right? And so I think you you still see that today, right? Walking down the street, the dominoes, you see a lot of the political clubs here, and so even within Washington Heights is considered one of the designated areas for uh, the Dominican Republic to for presidential elections, right? So it's a, a site um, and a considered a territory within the Dominican Republic's government of representation. Um, and so in many ways, um, there's such a strong connection that continues between the Dominican Republic for the diaspora to participate in what's happening in the Dominican Republic. And so you see a lot of the political clubs take office um, here in Washington Heights. Um, the sports clubs are very important. Um, and again, you know, baseball is always considered a, a Dominican pastime, but so are politics, right? And so that becomes a very strong space for people to come together to make sure that they know what's happening there. Um, and, you know, there's also remittances, right? Like the Dominican diaspora still sends um, one of the largest remittances to the Caribbean, to the Dominican Republic, and that really keeps the country afloat in many different ways. Um, and so the, the connection between the diaspora and, and the Dominican Republic is still extremely strong. Um, and the socialization and the organization of these clubs is really important, especially for meeting times of pandemics, meeting times of um, when families need support, a lot of them will turn to both the political and also the, the religious um, connections that you see a lot of the churches and storefront churches that you see around the area play a vital role for, for that. Victoria, you, you made the point that the double weight of the Holocaust and the Stalinist regime was a terrible burden, a trauma really for so many Jews in the Soviet Union. But were there also things that they picked up in their years in the Soviet Union during the Stalin years and afterwards that gave them forms of resilience and strength when they came here? Um, thank you for that question. Um, quite, quite interesting. I think when the, there was no freedom in the, in, the, in the former Soviet Union. So people sought freedom so, so badly. And when the doors were open, uh, majority of the younger generation who can make a decision left. And those left behind who were older, who were the product of the Soviet regime. Those who fought in the war, including personally my father, who is 95, who is a survivor and who are fighting in the World War II and survived. He did not feel their connection, the strong connection to the West and his decision to immigrate where it could have been possible in the 70s did not take place. So when my generation, when me and my sister were the age where we could make our decisions, we took the opportunity tremendously and uh, ran kind of for freedom. But freedom was not only religious freedom. And I wanna mention that because the Washington Heights community, possibly because of the German connection and because of the pluralistic parts of religion that came from Germany, uh, Washington Heights was welcoming the Russian Jews. It was welcoming with open arms and uh, because they were so much welcomed. But what happened in the kind of dynamic in, the, in those two immigrations, because the Soviet Jews were seriously brainwashed and were, were told what to do at all levels of life, when they finally got that freedom and when they immigrated, the least thing they wanted to be part of something even so warm and so fantastic as the, as the Jewish community, they were not ready for that. So later on, it took another effort. And I know that it created certain aspects of misunderstanding from the American Jewish community because they did not arrive to nothingness. They arrived to welcoming, including the Y. They arrived to the Y with many programs and many welcoming staff with different departments and neighborhood synagogues were opening their door to welcome them. But they were just not ready because freedom is not easily obtained. Um, when freedom is being given, we know it all as because of trauma and because of both Stalinistic regime and because of Holocaust. And not just Stalin, but in general, every single Soviet aspect of the Soviet life where freedom was not something they've been granted to an individual. So immigration granted that freedom. And in terms of resilience, the fact of merely surviving 
they were taught the Soviet Jews are being discussed as being almost uh, homo sovieticus, was a different species of a human because we live double, double lives. We live one life at work and in the society and the other life finally, true life at home. And that true life at home was really what kept us going. So the intellect, the, 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 the books, the music, they always compare it to a little bit to the German Jews because the, the incredible intellect that, that was the only refuge from, from the totalitarian regime was something to in, embrace yourself in the arts and in, in books and literature. And that got you somewhere away from the reality. And then only at home, they could be intimately with each other. So Washington Heights community presented uh, many, many wonderful opportunities for clubs but somehow those clubs and those affiliations happened more in Brooklyn where the numbers of the Soviet Jews were just much more greater. Um, so it's just an interesting slice of uh, reality. Oh, thank you. Lori, your book about German Jewish refugees compares <laughs> experiences in London and New York. What did you learn about New York by using this structure? Um. Yeah, that's a that's a great question. Um, you know, it's funny when I went into the the comparative um, approach, I thought I believed a lot of the you know America, the land of the free and the uh, American dream and the streets paved with gold. I kind of thought that that was how refugees saw their experience, and that might be how they remembered it. Um, but in the moment. Um, this idea of New York being open to all, um, I, I don't get the sense that it was any more or less open than London was um, before the war broke out. So when Germany invaded um, Poland and London and Britain declared war on September 1st, 1939, everything changed in London for the refugees. But before that, if we look at 35 to 39 in a place like London, the experience for refugees was very similar to the experience for refugees in New York. So I would argue that the it was more external circumstances rather than something essential about New York or essential about London that change the experience for refugees. The kinds of um, prior to the war, once war broke out, London was being bombed, German Jews were being interned, they weren't safe speaking German on the street. I mean, that then the differences between the two cities was extreme. Um, but I don't think uh, any that New York was diverse, yes, but, um, and perhaps visibly more diverse than, um, than London, but in Washington Heights, not so much in 35 to 45. There was a, an established Irish community there. Um, and many of the uh, German Jews who um, settled in Washington Heights, if they weren't working in the, on the Upper West Side, they, they may have been working in other parts of New York, in other parts of Manhattan, and may have seen people of different backgrounds and races. Um, but their, their lives were quite, um, they were based in Washington Heights. I mean, th those that lived there, they, they had a, a tight knit community um, and were trying to survive. So it wasn't, those in Washington Heights weren't, um, I don't know, it's hard, to, it's hard to put into words, but it, my impression was that they were trying to get through the day. And it wasn't like, I'm in New York and here's Broadway, you know, like they were just trying to survive. Um, and when the war broke out, how did that change for them in New York City? What did the er eruption of World War II and the U.S. entry of the war in December 41 mean to them? So let's just quickly go back to 39. So by th September 39, when war was declared, German Jews in New York knew that it would be very hard to get their family out. So that was a turning point. Um, Kristallnacht, or the, the pogrom, the Night of Broken Glass, when that occurred, you can see in the refugee newspapers how every, I mean, it affected every single person in, in the community. They, their dance clubs, their swimming clubs, everything came to a halt. And they put advertisements in the, in the refugee press like the Aufbau saying all activities are closed in honor of our, our loved ones in Germany. So um, there, 
they were very much aware of what was happening pretty much day to day in Germany and were constantly concerned about their family. So when war broke out in Europe, uh, refugees in New York, the, the, the mood and the shift, everything changed. They were scrambling even more so to try to, to get affidavits for their family. Although by the time 1940 came around, it was impossible. Um, once America entered the war um, after Pearl Harbor, um, and I write about this in my book, the Japanese Americans were the targets of internment as opposed to the German Jews in Britain who were interned. So th there were some um, small, slight instances of people feeling a little uncomfortable being German in Washington Heights, but really it was more refugees who didn't stay in New York, those who went to smaller towns or to cities outside of New York that felt that uncomfortableness with being German, but they didn't feel their lives were threatened. Um, and so when war broke out, they, they, those in Washington Heights, the, the kinds of things they had to deal with was, um, so about, I think 10,000 German Jewish men enlisted in the war um, for the US Army. My grandfather was one of them. And um, also there were rations, war rations, so they had to deal with that. Uh, their status changed if they weren't yet a citizen by 1941. So that meant that they weren't able to travel um, around the US. Um, and <clears throat> really um, there wasn't all that much of um, a difference for them in Washington Heights. There was a housing shortage as well. So people didn't move during the war in, the, in Washington Heights. There was a, a lot fewer um, advertisements in the newspapers for rooms for rent, for example. Uh, so the war did have an effect obviously on German Jews in Washington Heights prior to 45, but really it was um, the most pressing concern was about their families and what was happening and the fact that most of them stopped hearing from their families uh, by 42. A historian once observed that, that memory is not like playing back a tape, which scientifically chronicles everything that happened to you in the past. It's more like putting on a play. When you remember, you summon up certain characters, you set the stage in a certain way, and then you put on the play, but it's always a constructed mm -hmm. representation of the past. And I'm just curious, let, let's start with Cynthia. When, when people remember life under Tahir or they remember life with Balaguer, what do they talk about and what do they omit? Yeah, it's, it's interesting. And I feel like the more distance from that time period, it, it changes. Um, and so, you know, I think for, a lot of people who who remember, you know, um, who were exiled from from the years under Trujillo, who came to to New York from from that. Um, there were families who were also torn. There were young girls who who um, were taken at young ages. Um, I think that there is some of that legacy, um, you know, but. Some people also like to remember that under Trujillo, the dollar and the peso were one to one. Right, um, that sugar prices were, you know, at their best, um, uh, and so I think that the memory of a quote-unquote better time, depending on how you live that experience, um, colors how you reflect on it, um, and what, and then the nostalgia for it, um, and so you know, I think part of the work that I also do is around um, the 1937 commemoration of the Haitian massacre, right? Which, which was under the Trujillo dictatorship um, and was seen as a genocide of, the, um, of Haitians of Dominican descent, of Haitians, of anybody who couldn't say perihil, right? Which is uh, parsley in, in, in Spanish without rolling your R's. Um, and, you know, even today, you know, saying, you know, how you, how you call that, right? Like some people remember it not as the, the Haitian massacre, but as the Haitian invasion. Um, and that also colors how people see, see the border, how they see collaboration. Um, and so I, I think in, in many ways, um, you know, what, what's considered the uh, trejistas, right? The people that still um, believe in some of that hard, um, way the authoritativeness of the Dominican Republic um, 
as a way of countering some of the violence that they're seeing across the country, right? Um, seeing the exodus of the brain drain within the Dominican Republic. Um, but I think for a lot of us who believe in social justice and human rights, that period was a stain on the Dominican Republic. Um, it also forgets that for many, many years, um, Dominicans and Haitians work collaboratively, right? That people along the border are bilingual, trilingual, um, and hits people against each other. Um, and I think that that stunts the ability for growth. Um, and unfortunately, I think sometimes people take that, that stance um, when they migrate as well. And I think that that also limits their ability to, um, yeah, see the fullness of um, what we're able to do if we fully embraced each other. Victoria, I, I've noticed that since the fall of the Soviet Union, some Russians have praised Stalin's Russia in nationalistic terms, uh, described it as a country that was strong and respected. Is there any sense of that among Soviet Jews as they look back on their experiences? Okay. Yes. Thank you. Um, yes. Collective, collective memories, all of the trauma through memories and uh, back and back again, because all the memories come to us exactly like you said, Rob, uh, through certain selective memories, through rituals, through family narratives. Uh, one of the most incredible rituals that the Russians kept forever and forever possibly because, not possibly, but mostly because they emerged as victorious in the Second World War, because they were the liberators and many of them have liberated the concentration camps. So May 9th, which is now has a new name of uh, VE, Victory in Europe, was never been perceived as VE, it was the Victory Day. And my name actually, Victoria, resonates and was, was I was named for that Victory Day because um, every single family in Russia, every single family lost a person to the Second World War. So those, um, and then when we emerged as Victorias, uh, and my and my you know uncle, my my father's little brother, a young brother who was a brilliant physicist, was killed in the very first months of the war. So um, his name is a name of my sister, and I have the name of the victory. So um, the that that holiday and that tradition and that ritual, what made uh, a lot of people connect and connected to the memories, and they always wear a red carnations as their symbol of blood and also uh, the symbol of memory. And um, that carnation reminds us of the tears that are being uh, shed, you know, with a with, with hole. But in Russia, in the, so the post-Soviet Russia, with Putin's Russia, this holiday is being transferred into something, again, oppressive and, and horrendously monstrous. There are tanks and, and all the weapons marching and all these survivors who are now in the 90s and they're, and they're very, very frail, wearing these incredible medals and decorations are being dragged into that kind of like show because the real show is the militarism and show how Russia is victorious and how Russia can win and conquer anybody. And it's interesting how for the older generation, they also identify with that, with that power in a way. And many of them watch Russian TVs and many of watch watching show and, and not understanding the, the real degree of the propaganda that it's still marching and the oppressiveness of the regime because they escaped and there are certain nostalgia and certain, and certain mourning on something familiar, especially for the older population. The younger population is a, is a scary um, trend, what we see that the younger generation who doesn't know much about that collective trauma because their families have not told those narratives mm -hmm. are now going along and thinking about what would happen if we have that regime back. But uh, that's why I think our job and what we're doing here in this even in this discussion we are educating not just each other but we're hoping to do more and more for our future generations to really show and share the truth of of of, of what what this um world experienced 
collectively. And the community of Washington Heights actually brings all of us together into um, going through that. One of the great examples of sharing histories was the play that Victoria was involved in, Susua, Dare to Dance Together. And that play became a documentary film, which was also very fine in my estimation. And I'm just wondering, if Victoria, could you start talking about it? What did you learn doing that? And what did the young Jewish and Dominican kids who participated in that production learn from each other when they produced that play about the German Jews who found refuge in Sosua in Trujillo's Dominican Republic? Yes, with pleasure. Um, so Suar project was, was really my, my most favorite baby. I hope my children don't hear that. <laughs> it, was, it was a very, very powerful project that I'm very proud to um, conceive and identify. So when I started working in Washington Heights Y, I was struck by the similarities of the immigration experiences of the Dominican Republic and, 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 and Germany and, and you know, Russia or Ukraine or any of the republics. And all the residents in the Heights were carrying those experiences together, not really connecting with each other. And um, so I, um, I, I thought of, of, a, of a theme of Sesua, as many of you know, it's very connected to the German uh, Jews where they were given a chance to be accepted by any country in 1938. And the only country that accepted the Jews was the Dominican Republic. And uh, very few people kind of knew about the story. And to me, it was a way to combine the, you, those refugee experiences, but also to express gratitude for being saved. And that gratitude came as a, as a, as a theme in the subject of a, of a performance and play. And I was happy to have a glimpse of Peter Miller, who is among the audience. I hope he's still here because I want to show you all in the camera a film that has been produced by this project. Uh, the film is called Sassua Make a Better World. It's available for download. It's actually a curriculum that can be taught at school. It's the curriculum against genocide, against uh, persecution, uh, against racism, and it's for tolerance and acceptance and also celebration of gratitude. So the young kids from the Dominican Republic and uh, Russian Jews actually, and uh, some of the descendants of the German Jews were, com were all together in this production, learning about each other's differences and learning about the trauma of Holocaust. We, we learned about from the survivors, we invited survivors in that project. And that history became alive because they kind of like, uh, Liz, famous Liz Waiters who is no longer with us made a point that not somebody is playing the, the Hitler or somebody is playing Stalin or somebody is playing Trujillo. All the kids were into playing each other and they switched roles and switched with no outfits. I remember one young boy in the community, he was so excited about dressing up and changing his roles. And he said, when am I gonna wear a costume of Hitler? Where am I gonna wear a costume? And there were no costumes. There were kids playing absolutely interfacing each other and becoming one another. And that I believe what made the play such an incredible success. And it, if, you, if it's anything, it became a model for intergroup relations. It became a model of how various groups can connect when they're connected with history, with art, and the deeper understanding of such complexity as racism and torture and genocide. To me, one of the unforgettable scenes in the many times that I've seen in the play is when Jews played by young Jewish kids are lobbying the State Department to admit more Jewish refugees. And the Dominican kids play the role of the State Department officials. Mm -hmm. And they are playing it to the max, unctuous, bigoted, rude, offensive, right? And I always thought, I think those Dominican kids are channeling every rejection they felt in the United <laughs> States and dropping them on the U.S. State Department responding <laughs> to the pleas of Jews. Cynthia, can you add anything to what Vicky said about this story? I mean, just, you know, I think that, uh, and, and just to say that that's the full contradiction also of the Trujillo regime, right? So on one side of the island, you know, you have the Haitian massacre, but then internationally, you're also being lauded because you 
um, were seen as a refuge for, um, uh, yeah, for, for the German Jews um, in, into the Dominican Republic. And, and for some, they said it was because this larger um, uh, strategy to whiten the race. Of, of Dominicans, right? And so you you eliminate the darker uh, parts and bring in more more whiteness. Um, and you know, I again, like I, I think it, it's it's a beautiful thing. Um, but I, I think that's just so much. There's so much complexity um, with that period of time and and who who gets access. Um, and so to the original point around like you know um, Dominicans going through the the immigration process here for the United States, you know there is so much scrutiny, right? There's so much more rejection. There's so much more, um, you know, having to verify every single document, um, you know, uh, family blood tests, right? DNA tests um, as, as part of that, because there's this constant doubt about your, how you belong um, into the United States. And so I think having, you know, that space where they get to role play that <laughs> um, is, is really important. Um, and also to see how they're, they're connected because I think unfortunately um, race does play a, 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 you know, um, a role in how refugees were also accepted and how immigrants are also accepted and um, in, into Washington Heights. When you think about over-policing of um, some of the community areas, right? There is a divide between the west and the east side of Broadway. Um, and so to be able to have a space where young people can come together, see each other as, you know, um, um, yeah, come together just as, as equals in that and, and to really delve deep into that, that history, I think is, is really amazing. Um, and I feel like more adults should also do that. <laughs> yes. And uh, just a quick comment about that. Yes, it's, uh, it was remarkable to see the, the, the connection between, between the groups. But what, what was really amazing is that the Dominican kids specifically were not aware of the regime on their own. They did not know that. So many of them did not know. And forget about knowing about the Jewish experiences. And to think about how the same immigration experiences, it was a scene in the, in the, in, in the play, how the Jews have been going through the same immigration process and through the same scrutiny. And one of the baby in the suitcase was, the suitcase was taped. The baby's you know, mouth was taped so nobody could hear the sounds coming out of a suitcase. And we got that baby from the suitcase to talk about the story to the kids. And I think those like life lessons and life sharing that yes, Dominicans are going through a very hard time through immigration. Well, guess what? The Jews as well and the Soviets as well. I myself was stripped absolutely for any penny that we were not allowed to bring anything more to this country except for $100 per family. And we were stripped and checked that nothing, not even like family memories or little like rings, forget about rings. Everything was scrutinized and not allowed to be brought. So, uh, which has all those similarities between every single refugee group that comes and makes the United States their home. And I just, you know, just to add to that, I, I think that there's something too about how that history gets shared. You know, I feel like I didn't learn about the Haitian massacre until college, yeah. right? And so, you know, I was taught that like, you know, the Dominican Republic is, you know, for me was was family. We were there every summer. Um, you know, we went to the beaches, we rode the donkeys, right? The, these were the experiences and part of the love I have for this island. And then to kind of learn more, learn later as an adult, the complexities, right? Um, that how do you still have pride in, in your heritage, but also understand that there is space shame. for us to continue yeah there there, there is a shame and, and there is a wanting to to do better um and how do you plug into that and so i think that that is you know um i think something that many of those who sought refuge and what you pass on right so often you heard you know when you would ask questions about like but why did you leave if it's so beautiful and you miss everything and you miss your family and it's just like you know um you know what don't ask those questions just be grateful you're here Right? And, and the story ends there. So I think that there is a lot more that's needed for, for us to really understand um, history in all its fullness. But I also believe that the longer we know that history and the more we understand and the more we process the trauma, 
the better in a way we become and we become more empathic and we become more uh, just, if you wish, we become those, those justice advocates. And we, we can, we are the ones who, the ones who know about the trauma and go through this third generation, fourth generation, doesn't matter. They're the ones who will become leaders of the society, knowing and carrying that knowledge about the trauma and become just, just, just human beings. I want to come back to the question of justice and survival today in the very strange time that we're living in. But I first want to open up to people who are here with us in our audience via Zoom. If you can raise a thumb, if you can raise a thumb so people can see you, David Brown will try to call on you and share your question for one of the panelists. Yeah, hi, uh, this is David Brown. I'm the um, Director of Communications and Programs for Leo Beck Institute. And just a, a little bit of, of housekeeping, it's so wonderful to have about 140 of you here. Um, and we're gonna do this um, almost as if we're all in the same room. Uh, so if you click on participants, um, you should get a list of names with yours at the top. And to the right of that, there should be an option to raise your hand. Um, uh, and if you do that, uh, we'll try to call on you and um, give you a chance to answer your question. And I, and I also just want to say that we, um, we definitely do want to um, hear about your connection to Washington Heights. Um, uh, I think probably most of the people here have one, um, but if you can just keep that to a sentence or two at the beginning of your question, um, we'd really appreciate that just so that we can um, get to uh, as many questions as possible. So I see a question from Joan. Um, Joan, I'm going to unmute you and then you, uh, uh, you'll have a chance to, um, to ask your question and please let us know who it's for or if it's for all the panelists or, or for Rob. Joan, are you there? Yeah, I'm there. I'm, I'm there. Can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Um, I can't see myself on video. I don't know if I am or not. Anyway, uh, I was born um, in Washington Heights in 1940, three years after my parents arrived. I grew up um, on the east side of Broadway. Uh, which means that I grew up in a completely multi-ethnic neighborhood even then. I won't say completely multi-ethnic because it was 100% Caucasian, or at least uh, aside from two Asian children in my school, we were one third Jewish and most of those were not German Jews, although there were some. Stephen Lowenstein was actually in my brother's grade. Um, uh, the, uh, uh, one third Catholic and one third Protestant, and those were all white Protestants. Um, it was a very um, uh, diverse neighborhood. We got along with all kinds of kids. We got we learned to go along. But my family, on the other hand, my parents, um, who continued to speak German at home, um, which was my first language, my parents uh, had only German Jewish friends, even though our our apartment house was very mixed. Uh, and they did all the things that German Jews had done in Germany. They lived a German Jewish life, essentially, uh, in Washington Heights. They went to the um, Kunditerei, Nash's down on Dykeman Street, for those who, who knew the neighborhood. They, they took walks in Fort Tryon Park, you know, they did on Sundays. Uh, they did all they did all those things, but um, the, the I have actually written a book about trauma. Yeah, I I can't hear you now. I can't hear you. What is your question? Oh yeah, my question is um, how many people? Because I've heard a number of these talks. I've actually written a book about the German Jews of Washington Heights and about my own family's experiences. Um, uh, what is, I don't seem to get from many of the people who speak about the heights, you know, at that time, an awareness not only that there was actually a, 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 that the children who grew up in that time grew up in a diverse America. And I wonder how much uh, a, a diverse New York, uh, or less, but it was, um, you know, Washington Heights was, there was a borderline of color 
which was somewhere around 170th Street. And I grew up in, you know, in the upper 180s. And in any case, I want to know how much people are aware of that. I, it always disturbs me that there seems to be a model for German Jews. They belong to synagogues. They belong to organizations. None of that fits my family. You know, that, so I wonder, is there an awareness of this other, this other uh, German Jewish culture? Yeah, yes, okay. What, what I would say is that it's very dangerous to make overly broad generalizations about German Jews. When I researched Crossing Broadway, I went into the story with a belief that German Jews were overwhelmingly um, some form of orthodox, very conservative politically, and that was all you needed to know. In fact, in researching Washington Heights, particularly in the post-war years, I found German Jews who were conservative. I found German Jews who were radical leftists. My best informant was a German Jewish man whose father had been a communist in Berlin before World War II. So I think there are a lot of generalizations that you can make about German Jews, but they all fall apart pretty quickly when you poke very closely at them. One thing I would say that could confuse people is the Breuer community, which traces its roots to Germany, was large, well-organized, visible. People would assume that the Breuers were all there was to German Jews in Washington Heights. The Breuers are very important, but they were not the whole story of German Jews in Washington Heights. It's a much broader story than that. And I think yours is an important piece of that story too. Okay, we have another question from Renee Halberg. Um, and again, just um, you know, let us know your connection to Washington Heights, but please try to keep it uh, to, to one or two sentences at the beginning. All right, Renee, I'm unmuting you. Um, so if you're ready, please go ahead. And um, there you go, you, we should be able to thank hear you. Thank you. Are you there? Oh, well, hi and thank you, and I'll be very brief. So I grew up in what was what I called Lower Washington Heights, born in 1952, um, father came from Frankfurt. And I felt that that was a distinctly different part of Washington Heights. And I went to a nursery school called Help and Reconstruction, Soloveitchik, um, Yeshiva Public School 128, and um, Yeshiva University for Social Work, and don't live in New York. So my question is, what I found fascinating and inspiring in listening to Victoria and Cynthia and Lori is that so much has changed about Washington Heights. My question to any of you is, is there anybody or anything that has studied the situation um, of when the Cubans and the Dominicans and Puerto Ricans and Jews and Black people and Irish and Greek were living together in Washington Heights in the 1960s before I think there was a flight in many different directions out of Washington Heights. But it was a very spectacular time to be growing up there in the late 50s, 60s, because there were so many, so much um, entry and exit of different immigrant groups. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thanks, Renee. Robert, do you want to handle that since that's your more your area? I mean, I can talk about earlier, but. You start. Well, really, all I have to say about the 60s, uh, 50s, 60s, and 70s is what I know from talking with my mom and my grandparents and my visits there as a young child in the 70s. Um, so I have impressions and I have anecdotal uh, sort of evidence, I suppose, of inter, you know, the discussions about people of, who look different from, from you. Um, but I, I don't feel comfortable um, talking about broad, broader, you know, the period itself only because I haven't studied it. Um, but I, I know Stephen Lowenstein who um, the speaker just before mentioned, he wrote a book about the German Jews of Washington Heights. And I think that went up until the eighties that was covered, I think till 89. Um, so there, there's probably a little bit in there but it's not a, a strong emphasis on the Puerto Ricans, on Cubans, on African-Americans. Um, I don't know, I think Robert, you would probably know more since you wrote the book. What was it? What was the street you lived on again? Tell me again. Uh, I'm gonna have to unmute Renee again. Renee, what, 
Um, Did you say 152nd or 172nd? No, 161, just off River. 161. Street. So here's, a, here's something that I discovered when I was researching Washington Heights. And in general, there's an old saying, and it's, it's a nasty saying, but it bears repeating. Washington Heights begins where Harlem ends. I mean, that, and I've heard that phrase used by Black people and white people both. But buried in that phrase is an understanding that Washington Heights is a white neighborhood. And where there's an African-American or later a Dominican majority, it's no longer Washington Heights. And that's an absurd way to think, but a lot of people thought that way. But in general, change proceeded in Washington Heights and Inwood from south to north. And the people who lived in the southern part of Washington Heights had to learn to live with living in a very integrated and diverse environment much earlier than people in other parts of the neighborhood. And to be fair, many of them fled, in particular white. But those who stayed learned how to live with neighbors of different races, different ethnicities, different religions. And they valued that. I came across a heartrending story of a Jewish shopkeeper who was murdered in the early 60s in the Lower Heights. And an integrated neighborhood group said very clearly that they were deeply saddened by his death because they had been working very hard to maintain the Lower Heights as an integrated community. And they feared that a rise in crime would push people to leave and thereby the community would become less integrated. I think sharing the neighborhood among different races, ethnicities, religious groups, nationalities was always difficult for people. It was easiest to huddle up with your own kind. And lots of people did that. But the people who saved the neighborhood in the difficult years, in the 70s, in the 80s, and the 90s, were the people who stepped out of their enclaves and learned to work with people who were very different from them. And I think that was really helpful and inspiring, and we can all learn something from it. Um, I, I just maybe wanted to add, you know, I think that, um, you know, during the 70s and 80s, there was this big flight out of Washington Heights. Um, you know, there, there was, you know, the abandoned uh, buildings and, you know, a lot of people didn't want to live in Washington Heights. Um, and so I think what you see during that time is that, you know, for the same reasons that some other people came, it was cheaper rent, right? There was an opportunity to kind of have these bigger apartments and space. Um, and, you know, there's always like that one anchor family that then brings, you know, um, and then the bodegas, you know, like now the, the corner shop is, you know, has... Um, the platanos, right? And, and that becomes familiar. Um, but I think that for some of those Dominicans that first came, they wanted, some of them prefer to, you know, blend in with the, the Puerto Ricans, right? Because then nobody would ask them about their documentation. Um, and for a lot of folks, you know, um, the fact that, that some of these groups stayed when nobody wanted to stay during the, the 80s and, and early 90s, you know, with the crack epidemic with all of these things that really made Washington Heights undesirable. Um, you know, there's now this push to, to how do we, how do we maintain that, that population that, that served to kind of preserve Washington Heights. Now, as we see kind of the, the effects of gentrification and now Washington why high has become like a hot spot. Um, and, you know, over the last couple of years, there's been a push, you know, now, <laughs> Some of the streets are a little Dominican Republic, right? As, as an opportunity to kind of anchor some of that, um, that history and pay tribute to that. So I, I think that the neighborhood has changed over the years. I think that's similar to what you see in many different neighborhoods. Um, and sometimes people say that it's also an opportunity that as the economics of somebody's family change, they want to leave, um, you know, the Heights, the city. Um, so I think all of that plays into how a neighborhood changes, but I, I think that, you know, those were some really tough years, those two decades, especially around the 80s and 90s. Um, and, and I think the additional layer to, to that time is you also had a lot of immigration raids during that time. Um, the organization that I used to work for, Northern Manhattan Coalition of Immigrant Rights, starts in the 80s as a, as a defense for so many families being ripped apart during those ICE raids, or what was then, um, uh, uh, not Department of Homeland and uh, NSA. But, uh, NSA, yeah. So, um, so yeah. So all of that. Um. Monsignor Kevin Sullivan, who is to hey today the head of Catholic Charities in Manhattan, made this point to me. He was a parish priest 
in St. Elizabeth's in Washington Heights in the 70s and 80s. And he pointed out to me that old Washington Heights preserving housing stock saved Northern Manhattan from going the way of the South Bronx with a large amount of arson and abandonment. And Dominican immigration filling up that housing stock saved Washington Heights from the kind of population loss that devastated parts of Harlem. And that's a joint project, two wings of the same bird, you might say, as a, as a phrase from Caribbean history. And it's really important to recognize that. And today, obviously, the big challenge is economic inequality and gentrification. And that's the big question. And will the people who helped save the neighborhood in its hardest years be able to keep a home in the neighborhood in years to come? That's, a, that's pressing. Every time I talk about my book, that's what people want to talk about. Well, thanks, everyone. I see that Ellen has her hand up. So Ellen, if you're still there, I'm going to unmute you and you'll be on mic in uh, just a second. And uh, we'd love to hear your question. Ellen. Hi. Can Hi. you hear me? Yep. Okay. My name is Ellen. Hi, I'm Krakow. And I just have a comment to something that I think uh, Cynthia said, uh, that the Dominican Republic was the only country to take in Jews. No, Shanghai, China. I was born there, 1947. In fact, there's somebody else on here as a participant, my friend. Uh, Ivan Daniel, it's under Rene. We were born in Shanghai. Uh, my own story quickly, my family escaped uh, Nazi Germany, Berlin, 1939. They spent 10 years in Shanghai. They took in about 20,000 Jews uh, who lived there throughout the war years. Um, after the war, like I said, I was born in 47. We still couldn't get into the United States, but I want to say that the goal was always Washington Heights because uh, other family members had already gone to Washington Heights. Uh, Israel became a state in 1948. They took in all refugees and that's what we were. We were stateless refugees, which is noted on my uh, birth certificate. We lived in Israel for three years. Finally, finally, 1952, kind of late for most of us, we, we got, the, uh, all the proper papers legitimately. And we made it to Washington Heights where I grew up. I have to say I had a wonderful childhood. Um, we, again, we were, we were among ourselves, all German Jews. I went through all the public school system, graduated from <coughs> George Washington High School. And, what is your question? Uh, that's really it. Thank you. Thank that's you really very it. much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Um, uh, then we have uh, Beatrice, Beatrice Abrams, if you're still there. Can uh, I just clarify something? I don't think Cynthia said that, um, just to clarify. I believe Victoria said something along those lines, but probably didn't mean that it was the only place taking Jews. So I just yeah. wanted to clarify that. Yes. I think significantly, if you, if you connected to the Avion Conference, which happened um, in 1938 before Kristallnacht, uh, I think that is the context in which the Dominican Republic can can be said to have done something extraordinarily extraordinary and sort of unmatched um, in the in the international community. But then after November 1938, there was you know the Kinder transport and some other efforts. But um, yeah, it's a that's right. I, I was referring yeah yeah. I, I was referring to the Avian Conference specifically. Right. It took place in 1938. And at that time, the Dominican Republic was the only country that accepted the Jews. So uh, that history on that specific Avian Conference where we replayed and, um, you know, Rob was talking about how impressed he was when they played different governments, that, that was replayed in a play. And um, that was a moving part for everybody to find out. And partially that's connected the Dominicans as an expression of a gratitude for that specific period of time and history. All right, thanks. Um, we've got time for a couple more questions. I see Beatrice Abrams with her hand up. So Beatrice, I'm gonna unmute you. And um, once we can hear you, we'd love to hear your question. Are you there, Beatrice? I am here. And, okay. Um, thank you all for a lovely discussion. Um, I have no connection to Washington Heights other than my interest in uh, refugees and immigration uh, into the United States from Europe and other war-torn areas. My question, I, there are two. Um, one I'm curious, uh, Victoria, um, 
how religious were the Russians who came in, especially uh, in this from the Stalin period? Uh, the ones I've worked with who are Holocaust survivors really don't know anything about Judaism. Mm -hmm. And how did that interfere? How did that inter? How did they then interact with the actual Jewish community? So that that's one question. And the other is just a clarification. You you talk about Washington Heights. Um, not knowing it at all, as an integrated community. Were they truly integrated or did they live in segregated communities that had to interact because they had to pass each other? Okay, thanks Beatrice. Yeah, I can answer that. Um, so yes, as I mentioned before, um, the Russian Jewish community was not religious in general at all. The religion has been stripped by the Soviet government in 1917, and it was our, our for, it was a forbidden um, topic to discuss. There was absolutely no religion. The country became atheistic, and if you were uh, doing something underground and uh, not listening to the government, you could be actually caught and you could be punished. In fact, certain people who went to synagogues secretly to buy some matzah or to celebrate certain holidays were seriously uh, threatened to be expelled from universities and different places. In fact, um, one of my recollections of childhood is when I was part, maybe I was six, seven years old, and the teacher was asking children, what's the holiday? What is the holiday coming up? And I raised my hand, I really wanted to answer. And she said, okay, say. And I said, Passover. And uh, the teacher who was Jewish at that time called my parents and said, if they do something like that again, that they will have serious repercussions for her as a teacher. Turns out it was Lenin's day, birthday. So I was supposed to say it was Lenin's birthday. So to respond to that misunderstanding between the Jewish community that wanted to grant the Soviets their religious freedoms, without understanding and without knowing the depth of traumatic experiences that even though the Judaism became an ethnicity and every single passport had a word Jew on it of a Jewish person, uh, the Jew became ethnicity and not a religion. So that, that, that could not be changed with the generation that arrived. And the ones who expressed more interest did, did so. So yes, to answer your second question, that uh, the Russian Jews who arrived, first of all, they didn't know the language, and second of all, they could not connect to the larger Jewish community. They were invited for Passover, they were invited for different holidays, but it was very foreign to them. And uh, they, were, they were very happy about generosity, but they didn't understand how come they're being so much welcomed for just being Jewish, because their all long history has been being persecuted and being punished for being Jewish. Great, uh, thank you, Victoria. Um, I am going to, um, unless anyone else has uh, wants to respond to that from the panel. There was part of the question about being integrated. Oh yeah, and how integrated it um, was. That was the second. Um, yeah, I'm. I I am not qualified to answer that at this point, but um, especially because my focus is so so much earlier. Um, but I wonder. Again, it's really hard to make these generalizations um, and it, you'd have to look at specific periods of time and specific neighborhoods, you know, within Washington Heights, different streets had different atmospheres, different apartment buildings had a different atmosphere. So I, I can't really speak to that, but I just thought maybe someone else would want to address that. The community, the community was not really integrated and every group tend to be with each other, similar with the Sinti's experiences probably. Uh, people connected to, to their own language especially and they wanted to replicate something very similar. And uh, the, the programs have been culturally sensitive to the immigration and uh, to different groups. So we at the Y also had a, a special Russian department where Russian speaking staff would help them to apply for benefits, very similar to the German community. But uh, so that's the purpose of, the, of the, our play and our, our whole projects of how to integrate the community, but it doesn't come uh, forcefully. It all has to come naturally with the new generation um, with a lot of inter projects. I'm wondering, Robert, I feel like you had a really great story too to share around, you know, the big banner that was dropped 
Um, <laughs> I don't know if you wanted to share. Yeah, let me say that because it was it was a it was a and it sets up actually what I, a, a question I wanted to ask all of you. Um, a little over a year ago, uh, a white nationalist group called Identity Europa came to Northern Manhattan, and they stormed through Fort Tryon Park at the head of Fort Washington Avenue, and they hung a banner out over a terrace so that the banner could be seen on the Henry Hudson Parkway and from the other side of the Hudson River in New Jersey. And it was racist, xenophobic, anti-immigrant, and it was ugly. And that event took place over a weekend. And two days later, there was a huge community rally in Fort Tryon Park in opposition to that, that brought together every ethnic group, every racial group, every religious group. The Lieutenant Governor was there. Congressman Adriano Espaillat, the first Dominican American Congressman was there. And the, the mutual affirmation there and the hostility to bigotry was really, really moving. And, and for me, there was a moment in it when Congressman Espaillat directly rep, spoke to rabbis from Yeshiva University. And Yeshiva University in its moments has had difficult relations with the neighborhood around it, as almost every university does with its neighborhood. That's a common place in American cities. But I'll never forget Congressman Espaillat saying strongly, we remember when everybody else was leaving this neighborhood, Yeshiva University did not leave this neighborhood. You stood with us, we'll stand with you. The hateful ideology, he said, that drove your parents and grandparents to the United States will not be allowed to take root in Washington Heights. And the, the mutual affirmation and strength of that event was really, really impressive to me and unforgettable. And, uh, and just to add to that, uh, the role the Y plays in all this diversity and integration, just wanna mention that, that I think we could be, I'm not talking uh, just about one institution, but I think the institutions in Washington Heights are pretty um, open and very, very diverse. So we at the Y, for example, uh, when we do Passover, we have it in three languages. We have the special Seder, we have it in Spanish, we have it in English, we have it in Russian, and uh, the songs are all together. So the seniors are celebrating each other's holidays. It's very, very moving. And then when we offer jobs to thousands of Dominican kids to keep them on the street, off the streets and give them great jobs through the summer youth employment, they're all Dominican. And then we have other programs where the integration is so remarkably wonderful that we can only be proud of that. But of course, not in every aspect. And like what your Rob said, it's, it's, it's very moving to know that we're all together in this community and other communities can learn from us. Yeah, and, and I think I, I see it see it too. And also just to thank the Y, our school, um, <laughs> school in the Square has partnered with the Y. Um, and what we're seeing too is that, you know, the majority of our student population from the neighborhood is Dominican, but we also have Venezuelans and Mexicans and Ecuadorians um, and, you know, even from West Africa. And so there, there definitely is a, a growing diversity that's coming, um, you know, continues to come into to Washington Heights. And I think you know, these pillars of institutions are really um, places where where support is received. Um, and I think that in lots of different ways, the community comes together as kind of like, we're all in this in, in these moments of um, concern. And I think that's a really beautiful fabric. You know, I think that there's still issues around, you know, music being played too loud or um, there's neighbor to neighbor, but you're also seeing neighbors in, in each building providing food to to each other for the elderly whether they're dominican or jewish or you know there there is i think um a hometown feel to it even though in this very urban space last question you know we we, we face the pandemic now which has put new york city in the strangest place i have ever seen and, I, and i've lived here since 1980 um how is the community responding <laughs> how are folks helping each other through it. So I guess I guess I would love to take that question if you don't mind. Um, I can just tell you what the Y is doing and I can be prouder of the impact we have on the community. So while the many, many JCCs and the Ys closed their doors and moved only to virtual programming, the Y opened their doors 
to serve the community, the struggling, the poor, the undocumented cash workers who are not receiving any government support. So uh, we have uh, generous donations from our Jewish philanthropists through the UGA Federation and regular philanthropists who care about the justice being done and to understand that COVID-19 disproportionately affected uh, minority and people communities of color. So we just two days ago, we had a line around the Y of 700 people, which is not okay. And we stopped that the funding ended. We were giving out a $500 cash assistance to a family that lost a job, whether it's cash, whether it's not, whether it's a seller selling mango on the street. And uh, we heard stories that are breaking our hearts and Cynthia's family is from her school, I've been mm -hmm. part of those recipients. And then we also supporting local restaurants. One of them is a Dominican restaurant nearby. We are, we gain from the private donations, every single dollar raised during COVID-19 goes to provide relief. So we are providing meals, hot kosher meals to people who keep kosher. 125 black kosher meals are being prepared in Riverdale freshly, daily, delivered to people who need them. And uh, another 250 of regular population, many of them are Dominican descent, older vulnerable adults are being delivered fresh hot food from local restaurants. So we're Victoria, keeping the community alive, yes. Can, can we possibly, or maybe David, ask David, can we possibly put uh, a link to the organ, to the Y? Um, and if people want to make donations to the families that are living in the Heights right now. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it's very, that very would be really great. Thank you. Yeah, we, we don't have the chat. Can you add one, anything to that, Cynthia, quickly? Can you add something to what Victoria said? Yeah, I mean, again, just, just to say like how, how important it is to see this collaboration and uh, Victoria, we are so grateful. Families text me to say, you know, that they picked up the check um, and they were so scared because they haven't been able to reach out to government agencies. And so knowing that there is a support that somebody does care. Um, you know, yesterday we did our own food pantry and we had 150 um, families and community members come. Um, I think what you're seeing, especially as this pandemic um, continues that people are going to struggle more and more and more. We started our first pantry back in April 1st with like 40 families. And then just to kind of see that, that the need is growing. Um, I think Washington Heights, it's going to take a while for it to recover from this. So many small businesses and, and so much of the fabric that we've come to know as Washington Heights um, is truly being impacted. And so um, I think it would be wonderful. And, and maybe Victoria, me and you should connect offline and see how we can continue to, to collaborate. So super appreciative of all of the support the Y has Thank given. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Thank you, Lori, for bringing it up. I think because we don't have a chat box uh, <laughs> that I can type, yeah. I can just tell you all, if you just Google Y, Washington Heights, uh, and then with, we're the only Y, we're the only Jewish Y in the neighborhood, you get straight to our website and here you go. <laughs> Uh, we can email everyone who registered too. Um, I think that's a good place to wrap this up um, with, uh, you know, a story of the amazing work that you guys are doing in Washington Heights um, and, and, and the collaboration that you have. So thank you, um, Victoria, and thank you, Cynthia, both for taking time away from that. I know it's an, ex an extra busy time now um, to, to spend this uh, hour and a half talking with us. And thanks to Rob and Lori um, for joining us and for the great discussion. And um, I also want to put in a plug for Rob's book, Crossing Broadway, uh, Washington Heights and the Promise of New York City, which um, is such a great introduction to all the themes that we've been talking about today. And Lori's book, Cities of Refuge, um, German Jewish Refugees in London and New York, or that, that's a, approximately the right title. So you'll, You'll find them uh, on Google or but just by looking at our uh, event page. Uh, and of course, um, if you're interested in Washington Heights, um, our exhibition, as Billy mentioned at the beginning of the event, is online at www.lbi.org. It should uh, pop up right away, but you can also go under exhibitions there. And uh, we'll be doing more programs like this about Washington Heights and other topics. So. Um, thanks to all our panelists and thanks to um, all of you for, for joining us this afternoon. Um, it was great to see you all and um, I hope that we can all see each other in person sometime soon in, in, 
in somewhere in New York City, in Washington Heights, or down at the Center for Jewish History. So thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you, you all. You're all invited to the school when we open again. <laughs> <laughs> I'm busy. The why? Yeah. <laughs> Bye, everyone.